And one of the reasons why I think thinking about not being, about total non-existence, is so creative, is that in comparison with that thought, the fact that we are seems kind of queer. Death is not the end of consciousness. In other words, we are deluded by a kind of fantasy. If we think of death as endless darkness, endless nothingness is not only inconceivable, but it's logically absolutely meaningless because we aren't able to have any idea, much less sensation of nothing, unless it can be compared with a sensation of something. Stray, a mere video game about a cat, a cat walking simulator, or maybe a game that's a guided tour, a spectatorial experience of what it may be like as your favorite animal in certain circumstances. I would be lying if I said this wasn't really my expectation going into this game. Yet coming out, the experience seems much simpler, and for the better. It's not about being in a discrete, specific sense, but of being within itself in a larger whole. Relationally with others, and how that process compounds into experience. Putting it this way sounds more complex, and maybe verbally it is, but at the end of the day, I found Stray to do things in a much quieter way than I expected. Yet amidst this quietness, open, unused space, voids of verbal predetermination within the game, maybe only amidst this silence can we touch on complexity. This game quickly became one of my favorites, ever, and because of that, I deem it worthy of sharing with you right here on this channel, and hopefully this small interpretive subtext that I found or merely constructed in my own head, may prove eye-opening to some. For that, this is the philosophy of Stray. The contextual, narrative, form of Stray is important here. The game doesn't feel the need to verbalize much, because at the end of the day, speech is just one singular form of communication, and one that has severe limits. Stray has you playing as a cat who found themselves in what the game calls the Walled City, undeniably taking inspiration from Hong Kong's Kowloon, the most densely populated area in the world. The game's city mirroring a large underground city inhabited almost exclusively by robots after its human population perished, left only with a plague of head crab like monsters and sentient. Yes, sentient robots. Even though you are a cat, these robots still communicate in a conventional way, with the help of a robot friend of yours who can translate what the robots say within their native, coded, programmed language. But this is where Stray gets interesting. The game posits a question about communication, a hermeneutic of sorts, a philosophy of communication and language, with, in my mind, bringing the question forward is speech really the most impactful form of communication? In the game, the verbal form of communication isn't really the most prescient, nor necessarily impactful. The material interaction with their environment, their rather expressive appearances, demeanor, do arguably more in elevating the narrative. Here we get into a philosophy of language. I did a video on Noam Chomsky's lingual theory, the beginnings of where he theorized there is an innate, genetic disposition that allows humans to learn language. Chomsky essentially posits there is a language acquisition device somewhere in our brain that facilitates this learning. The main thing this theory helps with is an understanding of why humans have such a unique disposition to language over other species on Earth. Here with Stray, I find an almost theoretical juxtaposition, an opposite of sorts, an interactionist theory of language where language emerges from desire and their immediate material environment. While this theory doesn't necessarily negate biology, it simply moves to a constructionist viewpoint of language. But like language, mere verbal language is isolated. It's vacuous. It only determines connected narrative in one singular way. And in the case of Stray, it does way more with interaction. 
For such a simple story, what a profoundly smart way to carry a narrative. And in our own lived experience, how might we incorporate this? The game does nothing to explicitly explain what's happening in an upfront verbal manner. It's only learned by indirect explanation, by interaction with the world and desire. The reason this is so profoundly smart is because it's arguably the most reflective of our own lived reality. Our ability to really communicate, communicate in a sense that comes back to us, ingrains itself. In a more intimate sense, the first form of communication is often visual and even touch, while pertinently being informed by this desire, this will. If anything, this theory of language posits not merely biological capability of language, but that humans possess this desire, a will and a sense to communicate in a more abstract way. Going beyond biology doesn't negate it, but it can help explain how its biological function works in the first place. And in the case of our human experience, wrapped up and shown within an artistic version seen in Stray, a simple desire to connect. In the case of Stray, the journey being partaken by way of losing your feline family, falling into a walled city, all things that require a desire for said connection. For us, the will to understand our world beyond this, each other, life, and the sense we can actually grasp it. It's, if anything, a grasping, a strident push of will that allows us to parse our reality. Yet we are stumbling on to something here. A theory of language interaction is one thing, but in some respects, in order to make sense of desire, types of will, and connection, there needs to be a metaphysics of sorts, an understanding, a theory of nature. Now, you can interpret Stray in a number of metaphysics, but I keep coming to a metaphysics that mirrors much of the work around the French philosopher Giles Gilles Deleuze. Look, man, I, I'm a vulgar American and I will pronounce his name exactly how I want. That aside, specifically, we will focus around Gilles Deleuze's work around difference and repetition. So what's up with this difference and repetition thing? In order to even lightly explain this, we need to bring up Nietzsche. I know, I know, it's Nietzsche again, but this framework posited by Deleuze is tied to Nietzsche's concept of an eternal return or eternal recurrence. Okay, so this is where stuff gets weird and a bit difficult. This is where explanation is really needed and maybe a tad difficult, but even if crude, we need to do some explanation here. This can't be a complete explanation of Deleuze's response to the dialectic, his theory of difference and repetition, but it can be a video about its implications, namely seen through art, life, and in the case of the video, Stray. So if the eternal return posits that the universe, matter, energy, and for us, thought, cognition, our temporal projection of history, ultimately a process that infinitely repeats. If this is the case, we are then shackled to repetition of sorts. Yet on the surface, we can probably see this seems to make a bit of sense. We can still see fissures of this culturally, with fashion, with political ideology. Things really do tend to repeat on the surface. But as stated, this concept on its own is a bit incomplete. Like, are we actually really stuck doing the same stuff over and over? If this is the case, is there any chance of actual change, of novelty, of difference? Deleuze has a bit to say about this. Deleuze sees the world of process differently from the grandfather of a Western structural metaphysics by a, you guessed it, Hegel. I'm sure most here are familiar, but for all who are not, very simplistically, Hegel sees nature through binary contradiction. The process movement within Hegel's dialectic happens through negation, a subtraction of sorts. So seen in the world, water eroding a portion of rock, the subtractive nature of water carving a canyon, the movement towards death, disease, trauma that makes our conception of life possible. It's this negation, subtraction of immortality that creates our alive state today. 
the you-can-only-imagine-life-with-death sort of cliché you've all heard, as being alive means nothing without this death, this subtraction negation. And more pertinently to my lived experience, the social dialectic of the, um, actually devil's advocate in your intro to political science class, these can all be seen as a type of crude negation, just some more annoying than others. Uh, being a dialectician can be pretty annoying, and also a pretty effective form of male birth control. So, double negation for you. Okay, so Deleuze has something different in mind. It's not negation. It doesn't need to be negation. A subtractive element that pushes progress, but pure affirmation, affirmative, will that facilitates movement forward. So, what the f*** does this exactly mean? Well, we brought up Nietzsche earlier regarding the eternal return and Deleuze's repetition. Here we see Nietzsche's will to power in another form. The driving energy of nature being a strident will, an energy. But with Deleuze and his metaphysical reading of Nietzsche through positive, affirmative, creative difference. To Deleuze, our desire comes from an affirmative way of differentiation not the mere dialectical or psychoanalytic theory of desire that stems from nothingness, subtraction, and even things like social repression. Thus, difference and repetition mirroring a will to power and an eternal return, with a more Unitarian monism seen by Spinoza. To Deleuze, there doesn't need to be a duality, a negation, or larger dialectic at play, to Deleuze, there's a singular whole that makes up our nature, existence, and within the singular core is the multiple desires to express difference, but within that difference, containing newer different repetitions eternally. In the case of Stray, this idea just works for me. As I stated before, there is no explicit narration, there's no need, because the narrative organically unfolds. The game doesn't hold your hand throughout. Real difference isn't necessarily verbalized, told, demanded, it's discovered and created. The robots throughout the game encompass this motif. They are artificial robots, created, sculpted by another intelligence that has died off. Yet they have tangible personalities. They wear different clothing. They do different things. It begs the question within a whole if they are artificial to begin with. They rebel, they collaborate, they are human in the most prescient way that we can imagine it, minus the mortal biological coil we find ourselves in. In a Deleuzean sense, Stray serves as a reflection on the things that make us most human, that being affirmative desire, desire to communicate, to differentiate, Seen through this lens, the negation, the decayed backdrop of its world, is an artificial negation, not a metaphysical one. It's created. As the dialectic to Deleuze is created, so is the larger artifice of the world, and Stray. I find a subtext around desire and Stray, one that doesn't necessarily devalue it in the form in which it's facilitated, kind of at least. The current occupants of the walled city Robots were designed, programmed by their prior human counterparts, yet they desire all the same. A cat doesn't look at any robot any less. They don't discriminate. They don't stand as a mere partisan. They don't negate. They serve as an affirmative centerpiece in the narrative, affirmatively superseding identification. But, but, this is important. Don't mistake this for a narcissistic philosophy of the positive present grandness of the individual. With people like Spinoza, later Hegelians, and Deleuze, it's not about a fetish of the grand individual posited within modernity. In the case of Stray, the environments wrap you into different, discrete, environmental storytelling. Characters don't even necessarily push a narrative verbally, it's the environment, materiality, and amidst this, characters react with difference. Class is a strong centerpiece in this game. Every populated area has a specific culture, a representation of small, lived ideology found in our own world. Stray really does present its world, its inhabitants, as a larger reflection of our own. 
a narrative materialism. The location called the slums in this game is absolutely the most materially decayed place when compared to the more vibrant Midtown location. Yet, the game almost asks you to question where you'd rather be. The slums, while materially decayed and struggling, absolutely has the most communal, authentic way of living, and the robots reflect this. Whether that be from a lone musician, or a loving grandma robot who makes ponchos, some of these robots are depressed. They understand a specific type of danger they face due to this poverty. But amidst this, there is a communal, authentic spirit throughout. Contrast this with Midtown, a place that looks like New York's Times Square by comparison. Its robot population mirrors this as well. They are consumed with a type of consumerism seen in late stage capitalism, mirroring a hyper consumerist reality of our own. With a streak of people who hold a rebellious kernel against an authoritarian police state and that said consumerism within. The class commentary here is pretty obvious. This game does little to hold back on a commentary of our own lived reality within postmodern late stage capitalism. With this, I almost find a critique of the suburbanization of America. It's bland, lifeless setting, an escape from the urban poverty in favor of a more isolated, sterile way of life. It's interesting though, this game isn't really a cyberpunk world. It offers, to my mind, one of the only scenarios where it's post-cyberpunk. Cyberpunk is undeniably about the latest stages within capitalism, a corporate neo-feudalism where collapse is imminent. In Stray, the collapse has already happened. For that, it's arguably a more honest depiction to where we are headed, as in many ways, the worlds of Cyberpunk and Blade Runner are merely artistic depictions of our current reality at our lived moment. Outside the walled city, the game hints at a world that was uninhabitable to humans, inside a plague of monsters that festered. Yet mirroring our own lived reality, the former human inhabitants of the walled city ignored the incoming bacterial threat that would mutate and pretty much destroy the entire walled city thing. Yet minus complete human annihilation, I think Stray may be trying to tell us something that amidst the aftermath of catastrophe is where we have to fundamentally recognize ourselves in relation to others. Modernity, our economic systems, may posit an individual truly separate from each other regarding desire, need, and function, yet it's just a myth. And what a way to shatter that myth than the absolute obliteration of the present. It's ironic, war, natural disaster, a pandemic are all those small kernels that contain in them a possibility of a better world because it forces us to recognize our lived earthly relation. With Deleuze's metaphysics in mind, Stray just fits this to me. And in the game, the most striking of this is that tree village place. I think it's the ant village. I'm not entirely sure of the name. Don't hate me. But this place, this place, look. We as Westerners, we think an urban-rural divides. Agriculture, manufacturing, poor, rich. All explicit dichotomies straddled against an opposite. But what this ant village does is it shows us there's just monks out there. People who are like, screw the socially instilled dualism stuff. And they go live on a mountain. But please don't mistake this analysis for an idealistic escape that can be easy to cling to. The whole abandoned society in favor of unfettered natural freedom sort of thing. I'm a Hobbesian in this regard, and that is not the freedom you think it is. The point here is that this portion of the game, the idea of monks, reminds me of a type of real, genuine difference that's not the same socially instilled binaries. One that posits a rural, urban, modernist divide. Standards sold to us as it fits a type of productive need. Look, there's, there's a million ways to interpret art. I could be a dialectician. I could be a process ontologist or whatever metaphysical theory I choose when interpreting Stray. That's the damn cool thing about art. It begs for multiples. It needs varied interpretation. I have a small theory with art, a hunch that some of the best art is a balance of the ambiguous and the explicit. The ambiguous instills a type of wonder. 
The explicit imparts structure and a type of clarity. Stray seems to fit that bill very, very well. It's probably the best game I have played in a long time, and for that, it deserves this video. You should buy it, and you should play it. Thank you all for watching. Hoping you all enjoyed this unique one. Cats, metaphysics, and games are always a fun topic for me. Before I go, I, of course, want to give a huge shout out to all the people who directly make this possible and the ones who really go above and beyond. Thanks so much to Valerian, Ogle, and Kate. You three really, really go above and beyond. My absolute gratitude goes to you three. Again, for everyone else, I really hope you all enjoyed, and I hope to see you in the next.